Good afternoon. It's Monday the 6th of February 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Garish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Well, it is uh, particularly chilly here in uh, Plymouth and reports around the country are much the same. So we'll move on and get a bit of uh, warmth into our news reporting. Um, before we go to the first slide, I'd just like to say that uh, it appears that the BBC has suspended reality. But we'll come on to that in a minute, moment. First of all, we would like to say Lady Smith released the tapes. And uh, this is really an introductory um, uh, piece on uh, a very in interesting incident in which uh, this lady judge has apparently refused to release the tapes, which um, Robert Green has been asking for. Uh, these are tapes of a previous court hearing in which Robert Green says the judge made racist remarks. Uh, interestingly enough, these were anti-English remarks. And um, he's asked, Robert Green has asked for the tapes to be released. Lady Smith has apparently said, I have listened to the tape and he doesn't say that. Therefore, I don't see why we should release the tape. So apparently we are to believe Lady Smith, even though members of the public who were present in that particular court hearing with Robert Green are also of the opinion that the judge uh, made racist remarks, sheriff, I should say. Interesting state of affairs where we just have the judges say, well, no, no, you, you believe me. I'm the person uh, to say what's right and what, what's wrong, what's truthful, what's not. Just believe me. Release the tapes. Release the tapes. Um, well, let's, this is uh, the start of Channel 4's Fake News Week. We'll mention that again in a second. But uh, since uh, Hannah Arendt is getting so much coverage at the moment, uh, people buying her books uh, as a result of Trump and whatnot, I thought we'd just have a quote from her. She said, if everyone always lies to you, the consequence is not that you believe the lies, but rather that no one believes anything anymore. And of course, that's what is at the heart of uh, the fake news agenda. Um, because if uh, if we are all convinced by the mainstream media, by our politicians, that everything that we see, everything that we read, everything that is on video, on in images, that it's all fake, then of course we're left totally at sea, not knowing what to believe. Uh, and in the meantime, the agenda presses on. Well, let's uh, look at a fake news story. Um, here's the Telegraph. This has been, I'm not single out, singling out the Telegraph here because uh, this has been similar headlines in other newspapers as well. Robot civil servants could save taxpayers cash by replacing 250,000 jobs. Uh, and they're citing uh, a report from Reform, uh, a public services think tank, um, which they say suggests that 90% of Whitehall's 137,000 administrative staff could be replaced with quotes, artificially intelligent chat box, chatbots by 2030, saving 2.6 billion a year. This is total fake news. Well, okay, not total fake news, but the way that this is being presented is utterly fake. So here is the report, work in progress that they cite. Um, and uh, the only time that 250,000 is mentioned in this entire document uh, they say a failure to learn from mistakes pervades healthcare. There's an estimated 12,000 avoidable deaths each year in hospital, but it is unknown which deaths uh, these are of the total 250,000 hospital deaths. So that's the only time 250,000 is cited by the document with refer reference to hospital deaths. So I'm not quite sure where the Telegraph gets the, uh, the comment, but they also... Uh, Telegraph quotes the phrase artificially intelligent chat box, chat bots. This phrase does not appear in this document anywhere. Yeah. So where is the Telegraph getting this? Well, I believe that what the Telegraph has done is they've gone to other sources which are cited by this report and, and looked at those and pulled out some information from that. But nonetheless, their, their news report is incorrect. It's inaccurate. Uh, and uh, so... What the, the report says is that some public services are already delivering the vision H of HM. Revenue and Customs has reduced the numbers of administrative staff from 96,000 to 60,000 over the last decade through expanding online services and providing better real-time information. It aims to reduce 11,000 more jobs uh, as it aims to become more, quote, diamond-shaped. Uh, reductions of jobs must be done strategically. However, as a better way of working rather than salami slicing rolls to make savings, by following this approach, 
Whitehall, the NHS and police can reduce headcount significantly, according to the oft-cited analysis by Oxford academics Frey and Osborne. Many routine administrative roles have a 96% chance of being automated by current technology. Uh, applying their calculations to current public sector numbers suggests that over the next 10 to 15 years, central government departments could further reduce headcount by 131,962, saving 2.6 billion from the 2016-17 wage bill. So that's 131,962, not 250,000. So and and they're talking about current technology, not uh, future uh, AI chat chatbots, uh, and they're talking about uh, online services which are currently being uh, presented. And so this uh, article I'm calling fake news because it's insightful. It's not quite accurate. It's per perhaps promoting a, a dystopian Distorted. future, but it's not. It's not something that's reality at the moment. And that's the pattern across many of the uh, mainstream newspapers that we're seeing at the moment, coupled with the fact that they use journalistic articles from people who seem to have no uh, in-depth experience in any of the, the uh, topics they cover. So man many of them are effectively bloggers who occasionally write an article for a mainstream newspaper. Um, as I mentioned... Channel 4 Fake News Week starts tonight. They, they're kicking off on Channel 4 News at 7 p.m. tonight, apparently. Uh, I suggest everybody goes and has a look at it for the comedy value, if nothing else. Um, I also suggest you go and have a look at the, uh, the, the uh, trailer for this, which is on the Channel 4 YouTube channel. It is fantastic. Um, and so uh, we shall have a laugh at this later on. That's all I want to say about that. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see how that pans out. I've been having a little bit of a look at, at um, who Channel 4 uses to produce some of its documentaries, and I think there's a lot more information to come out there, Mike. Um, can we also add at that point that uh, if any of our viewers and listeners can give us uh, help by flagging up blatant fake news by the mainstream media, this is extremely important because, of course, this can be put into the government's very own inquiry into uh, so-called fake news, headed up, of course, by an MP who's highly experienced, having worked at uh, the spin machine and advertiser Saatchi and Saatchi. Uh, well, here we are. The BBC apparently has suspended uh, reality. I went on to the Reality Check website this morning, expecting to find the latest uh, from the BBC. Uh, but um, the latest date here is the f is the first of February. Um, now I I did a screen uh, a reload of the web page. I later checked it again, and it would appear that at the moment that the BBC isn't checking reality anymore. I was intrigued by that. Uh, I wondered whether it was some mistake on the web page, so I went over to have a look at their Twitter page, and here it's February the third. So all of a sudden, the BBC that was boasting this big team, anonymous team, of course, because the BBC wouldn't want to actually tell you who was checking uh, for fake news. But all of a sudden, reality has stopped uh, and there are no reports. I wonder why this could be, Mike. I think they're digging a hole for themselves that they can't crawl out of. I, I think this could be the case. And again, if we can say to uh, UK Column supporters, if you can give us help, with real examples, they must be real and evidence-based examples of where the BBC is fabricating the news, then of course we've, we have a, a very good stick uh, to beat this £3.65 billion pound propaganda machine uh, with what is truth. Yes, well, Boris, Boris Johnson, our illustrious Foreign Secretary, is in uh, Brussels at the EU Foreign Minister's meeting, Foreign Affairs Council rather, uh, and he said, this is fantastic, uh, he, at the doorstep uh, press conference this morning, he said, we will be doing a bit on Libya this morning, uh, talking about the needs to unify the East and the West of the country, building on the Libya political agreement, seeing what we can do there to be more creative, whilst of course at the same time addressing the refugee crisis, the migration crisis, as you know, at Valletta, the Malta summit, Britain pledged another £30 million to help tackle that crisis, proving once again, as I never tire of telling you, that we may be leaving the EU, but we're not leaving Europe. We remain absolutely committed to that joint endeavour. 
So there you go. This is being used once again to push forward with uh, EU military union. Uh, but it was just the, the flippant way he was describing this. We'll be doing a bit on Libya this morning. So we bomb, bomb the hell out of that country. We destroy um, its stability. We destroy its infrastructure. Uh, and then we come back a little bit later and uh, do a bit. Yeah, well, uh, is this man mad? Mike, he's certainly incredibly dangerous. Um, and why do we have to put up with this um, clown hairstyle representing the, con the country? Uh, I, I personally find it offensive. This may be a little bit of my background, but I look at this man, for him to appear like that representing the country, he's actually taking the mickey out of the whole of the British public, in my opinion. Yes. Well... So what are they discussing? Well, they're also discussing Ukraine, of course, at this meeting. Uh, the council, which, uh, of course, is chaired by the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Federica Mogherini, because she's into everything these days, uh, will discuss the situation in Ukraine. They're expected to assess progress on the implementation of the reform agenda. Uh, and, of course, they'll be uh, hurling some bad words at Putin or something as well, undoubtedly. They'll be discussing Libya, as we mentioned. They're also going to be discussing Egypt. Uh, because uh, they want to um, forward, bring forward EU-Egyptian relations. Uh, they're specifically discussing migration, counter-terrorism. Uh, and then they're also ta talking about the Middle East peace process. So that's all good stuff. It doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence, uh, though, it has to be said. No. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, the war that nobody wants to talk about, that is Yemen, uh, continues. Uh, and over the, at the end of last week, mid to, to the end of last week, we had this report of, uh, well, what was apparently Donald Trump's first foray into Yemen. Uh, United States commando raid, which uh, apparently started a firefight. This was with uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP. Uh, and, uh, well, the Americans, although they didn't uh, admit specifically what had uh, taken place, they said that civilians were likely killed in the raid. Uh, but that's all right, because it was the United States that killed civilians in that case, and uh, whereas if anybody else kills civilians in any other uh, case... Yeah, then, that's then, not okay. That's not okay, yeah. but it's okay in this case. So it was uh, one Navy SEAL killed, uh, as many as 30 civilians, including 10 women and children. Uh, so there you go. Uh, in the meantime, uh, 21st Century Wire reporting this morning that uh, a Yemeni missile has struck Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is uh, according to 21st Century War sources in Sana. They're confirming that uh, reports of a Yemeni ballistic missile uh, striking uh, Sir, uh, sorry, Saudi Arabia are true. Um, and this happened on Sunday evening. And they're saying that uh, back in late October, regional news outlets uh, reported that Yemeni missile had struck near Saudi's second city of Jeddah, while the Yemeni army and popular forces had launched a 12.5-meter-long uh, Borkin-1 a uh, ballistic missile from Sada province uh, landing in uh, at a Saudi uh, airbase at Jeddah, but they've now apparently also uh, hit the Saudi capital. So um, no doubt there'll be uh, even more um, bombings from Saudi in the coming days. It's a very interesting um, story. I think there's some more reporting to do on that uh, as to who's got what technology and, and uh, who's capable of that. Well, to be honest, it's a, I think it's a bit similar to what happens in Israel. You know, Israel uh, sends weapons over with uh, uh, white phosphorus and so on, and the uh, Palestinians are firing uh, what containers full of whatever uh, they've yeah, got, whatever back. they've got yeah. available, and that's a similar situation here, as far as I can see. Um, in the meantime, Donald Trump in trouble uh, as usual, uh, and uh, so he was giving a, an interview to Bill O'Reilly on Fox News uh, just before the uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, and uh, they were talking about Putin, and uh, Trump said, well, I do respect him. I respect a lot of people, but that doesn't mean I'm going to get along with them. But he said he did respect uh, Trump, uh, and Bill O'Reilly said, well, but he's a killer. Uh, and then Trump responded by saying, well, there are lots of killers. Uh, we, we've got a lot of killers. What do you think? Our country is so innocent. Um, so he's perhaps talking about Hillary Clinton there, Barack Obama, uh, but this didn't, go, uh, this didn't go down too well. Trump also said, uh, take a look at what we've done. Uh, we've made a lot of mistakes. Well, um, the usual suspects came out and criticized him for it. Uh, Mitch McConnell, Senate leader, said, I don't think there's any equivalency with the way the Russians conduct themselves and the way the United States done, does. 
Uh, Putin is a former, former KGB agent, a thug, not elected in the way that most people consider a credible election. Um, and uh, so that's incredible. Uh, apparently, we can't compare the democratic American leadership with uh, a killer like Putin. Uh, OK, well, that's interesting, Mike. Of course, all this sort of information comes from a variety of sources. We'll, uh, we'll come on to that in just a couple of seconds before we do. Uh, here's the question. Would you let this man teach your children? Uh, because he's going to be teaching your children. And uh, this is uh, Mr. Martin from the National Cyber Security Service. And we should remember, of course, that uh, our illustrious former uh, chancellor, um, George Osborne. Thank you. George Osborne uh, was the man who went into none other than GCHQ saying that uh, clearly this organisation needed another £1.9 billion uh, pounds in order to do its job, which, of course, is to create all of the so-called intelligence and, I would add, propaganda around the uh, terrorist situation in the world, which, Mike, uh, you've just run through mm. some of the areas. So um, why have we flagged this up? Well, we've taken the Gloucestershire Live story, but it's in other mainstream papers. It says that um, GCHQ is training teenagers to help the UK fight off cyber attacks. Uh, so the newly set up cybersecurity arm uh, is going to be running residential courses for two and a half thousand teenagers this summer, as well as one day courses for 11 year olds called Cyber First Adventures. Uh, GCHQ is also offering work placements and bursaries to a thousand of what it calls the brightest and best students by 2020. It's part of the recruitment drive. Uh, it's also had a big recruitment drive for schoolgirls aged 13 to 15 as a plan to recruit more uh, female spies. Their word, not mine. And of course, Defence Secretary Michael Fallon has said Russia is weaponizing information and accused Moscow of using the internet to disrupt critical infrastructure and disable democratic machinery in a series of attacks on Western countries. Well, well now, that, that's, that's really important because, of course, one of the big stories that the BBC was covering this morning was the fact that David Beckham's emails were hacked, uh, and it was the Russians that did that. It was the Russians. Uh, well, th that is a possibility. OK, yeah. um, well, let's um, just follow through really what's going on here with GCHQ and having a good think about this organisation let loose with young children. So we've got GCHQ recruiting thousands of 11 to 15 year olds. So we're down at the age where the children haven't even got to grips with numbers, but they're going to be taken under the wing of GCHQ to be taught about uh, spying. Um, they're going to go on training days and summer camps. And let's remember that they're young, innocent and highly impressionable. So they're going to be at the complete mercy of um, information and techniques used by GCHQ and other trainers. Uh, spying is exciting. So I would uh, suggest that the children will believe everything they're told, whether it's true or not. And at that point, we can say that all the material presented by GCHQ will be biased towards their view of the world. So that includes the right to torture and to kill terror suspects without trial, which, of course, is ideal material for young children. And then once they've been indoctrinated into the government GCHQ view of the world, these youngsters will then help ramp up the fear of, of uh, terrorists even though that many of these terrorist organisations were created with Western funding and arms. And then what are they going to do? Well, the children are going to go back and report what they've heard, and they're going to believe that they need to report what they see and hear. So these children will now become the UK Stasi children, um, spying on family, friends and neighbours. So that what you've done is started to train young children to be, I've called them unwitting agents of the British state. And then on the return to their schools and colleges, they're going to spread what they've been told, seen and experienced. So it's not just the thousands of children that GCHQ get their hands on in the first place. These children, of course, will go back and easily convince uh, their peers uh, of what they've been told. And I'll end by saying we should remember, of course, that GCHQ 
is a common purpose trained organization itself. Unbelievably, believably, uh, political charity Common Purpose has been in training GCHQ. And of course, one of their techniques is NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Is GCHQ going to be using reframing techniques on these young, young children? I think, Mike, this is one of the most dangerous um, plans that I've seen. This is clearly deliberate. It ties in with the government's big society agenda, uh, where according to the government, David Cameron and um, Eric Pickles in particular, they said that they were going to train hundreds of thousands of young British teenagers to become part of this uh, communitarian uh, big society agenda. So anybody who thinks at the moment that David Cameron's big society has died, absolutely untrue. And now we see GCHQ pulling in innocent children to be reframed. And I would suggest in some most dangerous views of the world. OK, uh, quick advertisement. Uh, Vanessa Bailey will be back in the UK uh, on the 17th of February, which is uh, Friday week, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. She'll be in Bristol at the Ark. Um, she, the talk is uh, Fall or Liberation, an unravelling of BBC fake news. Uh, please get along to that if you can. We understand uh, there is going to be an attempt to disrupt that event. Um, and uh, so perhaps uh, if we can get as many people along to that would be pretty good. For polite, well-behaved support. Absolutely. And of course, Vanessa absolutely deserves that for all of the extremely hard work she's done and the risk she's taken to get the truth out of Aleppo, uh, unlike, of course, the BBC and other media channels. Yes. Now, the Queen, hip hip hooray, because uh, this is now her, she has now become... Uh, Sapphire Jubilee year has begun. This is fantastic, isn't it? Uh, she uh, has had a new portrait done. That's not it on screen. Uh, but uh, the new portrait shows uh, her at the age of 90 wearing a necklace made of 16 large oblong sapphires surrounded by diamonds with a matching pair of drop earrings. So I'm delighted by that. I'm Good. really pleased for her. Um, and uh, Theresa May had some wonderful things to say. She offered congratulations. Hailing the Queen is truly an inspiration to all of us. She said, I know the nation will join with me today in celebrating and giving thanks for the lifetime of service Her Majesty the Queen has given to our country and to the Commonwealth. Uh, and she said it was a testament to the Queen's selfless devotion to the nation. Um, does that, uh, do, you, do you find uh, empathy with that sentiment, Brian? Uh, not particularly, um, because I believe that the Queen did nothing as um, the country has been handed over and our constitution handed over effectively to the European Union. Um, this is the mediatization which she accepted. Well, so uh, I'm not a fan, I have to say. Uh, among other breaches of our coronation oath, of course. Now, the last queen who, by coincidence, was born on this day uh, in uh, the 17th century, uh, to the last queen to withhold royal assent from a, an, a bill of parliament uh, was Queen Anne, um, who died under potentially mysterious circumstances, by the way. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that because this uh, would have been her birthday today. Uh, and uh, it seems like a bit of a coincidence that these two events are happening on the same day. Okay. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, Queen Elizabeth should take some inspiration from Queen Anne and uh, do something about some of the uh, unconstitutional and treasonous activities. of. Um... I don't think there's any chance of that, no. uh, Mike. If we wanted to be at all sympathetic, she's an extremely old lady. All of her advisors have been pro um, EU, all of her close um, personal secretaries have been pro-EU people. Um, and of course, the agenda is still that EU integ integration. So she's been effectively pushed off to the sideline. Personally, I do believe she has betrayed this country. Some people don't think that's the case, but the min minimum is that she's, she's not going to lift a finger. Duke of Edinburgh is not going to do anything. Charles well, when he is on the planet, most of the time he's still la la land. But when he is on the planet, he's not interested in this nation. He's he's got other more important things in mind: supermarkets in Cornwall. So I don't think we're going to get any help from any members of the royal family. Okay. Nothing wrong with the royal family, just the wrong family that's in the post at the moment. Yes. Well, let's get on to important news. I tweeted out this image. I've got an extra bit of the caption at the top. Um, of course, this is Madonna. And I, I had uh, 
uh, juxtapose that uh, picture uh, with a Muslim lady. And my point was uh, that on the left, we have the BBC pushed pop culture and on the right, we have modesty. Well, I've now added to that West subverts with Gaga Super Bowl satanic porn. And for those who aren't aware of it, uh, the Daily Mail apparently thinks that uh, Lady, Lady Gaga's performance at the Super Bowl was so important, it should have more news coverage than any other single topic. And if you think I'm joking, I've just taken a small clip of video. Apologize that this, is, um, this has got demo slapped over the top of it, but I'm still going to run it because it shows us the sheer madness of the British media at the moment. She blew the lid off. Lady Gaga calls for unity in electrifying performance at Super Bowl 51, singing America the Beautiful atop the uh, stadium in Houston. So we're not really interested in what the president of the United States says, but Lady Gaga um, just about wearing clothes gets up and, uh, well, let's have a look. I'll just have to talk you through it. Um, but um, this is online. This is the Daily Mail. It goes on and on and on. Key feature, of course, is the demonic uh, flames. Uh, we've got uh, demonic stars either side of the stage. Uh, we've got provocative dress. Drones, Mike, 300 drones launched in order to give uh, pretty effects in the sky and, of course, promote the drone technology. Are you looking at stars? Are you looking at drones? Nobody knows. Um, the audience apparently going absolutely mad. This was the best thing they'd ever seen. This is high quality entertainment. On goes the flames. Less and less clothes, more and more provocative um, poses. Um, just a bit of mention that it was something to do with an American football game, but I think that was incidental. Um, I, I almost don't know what to say. This is so unbelievably crass but this is the culture of course that the west through the bbc through bbc media action for example is imposing on the values of eastern societies uh, and i look at this and i say what right do we have to get into any foreign country to change their system of democracy this is a this is utterly obscene and um well, the pictures say it all. Can we move on? Uh, we can. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, sale of assets, Brian. This is something that we mentioned uh, several months ago. Uh, but apparently we now have a report uh, telling us a little bit more about sale of assets in this country. This, of course, is government assets uh, and particularly buildings. Um, and this has come from the Cabinet Office. So maybe this is why the Treasury... Uh, didn't know anything about this when I asked them because uh, the Cabinet Office and the Treasury never speak, it seems. Uh, no. No. The uh, Minister of Transparency was, of course, um, Francis um, Maud. Maud, Maud, Maud. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the government has reduced its estate by 300,000 square metres. That's good. Uh, that's going to save £176 million in running costs and bring uh, a billion pounds uh, in total of running cost reductions. That's fantastic. So this is called this is rationalisation of the estate apparently, uh, and it's reduced its size by uh, a quarter. It's uh, further billion pounds in capital receipts in 2015 2016. Um, of course, we don't know exactly what has been sold, uh, and we don't know what's been done with the money. No, because it's difficult for the government to keep account of it all. It's that, tricky. That's right. So when I asked the treasury anything about this, they said, "Oh, we we don't have this information. We don't know anything about it." Uh, it could be anything, really. So th this is just uh, possibly more fake news from the government this time, but uh, you just can't possibly know. It, it is published, but uh, unless the Treasury you know, is keeping a record of it, who knows what's going on. Uh, Chris Skidmore, who is the Minister uh, for the Constitution, said, the way in which you're managing our buildings will bring about positive and lasting change. Yeah, this is talking about the close down of Westminster, I would imagine. But isn't this one of the 11, 13-year-olds who's going on the GCHQ course? <laughs> I, I refuse to believe this is a minister. I think this is one of the youngsters that has been chosen to go to the donut. Well, in fairness, I, chose, I found a copyright-free uh, image of him, but I don't actually know when that image was taken. Okay, so he could be 13 then. It, it, yes, indeed. Um, okay, so some genuinely uh, interesting news now. 
Uh, this is uh, John Brown, uh, who, this is not Lord John Brown um, of uh, fracking fame, by the way, just to clarify. This is John Brown, who was a Conservative MP uh, from 1979 to 92, and then became uh, Vice President of UKIP. Uh, and he was interviewed by Fox Business News on the 3rd of February. Uh, and he uh, absolutely uh, called for uh, Glass-Steagall. He said that the takedown of Glass-Steagall was the cause of the current financial problems. And for anybody that doesn't know, Glass-Steagall was the act of uh, uh, the US government in the 1930s to split the uh, investment banks from retail banks. Um, and uh, so he said that, uh, uh, at, sorry, what he said was, at the root of the crisis is that America abolished Glass-Steagall when banks, which had to be uh, secured for their depositors, uh, began to get involved in investment banking, getting them into highly speculative, in speculative instruments. I think that the reintroduction of Glass-Steagall, which separated banks from investment banks, uh, should spread to Britain and other countries because it takes speculation out of banking and hence the need for government to stand behind them with taxpayers' funds. Uh, which leads, of course, to more speculation, gambling with clients' money, and leads to taxpayer bailouts and more huge profits at these banks. The prices of banks are so high today because they reflect these exotic instruments, which have such high returns. Uh, and to get back to dear old banking will be tough in earnings, so it's not popular, but it's the only solution. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, you see, all, the, all this gambling, billions and trillions of dollars get wiped out. It's disastrous for families. There has to be a strict division of these instru instru sorry of these industries. I'm for deregulation, but the crisis is entirely due to the fact that Glass Steagall was abolished. So, um, so I suppose what he's saying there is that uh, um, the investment banks should be free to do as they please, but they should not be uh, impinging on the rest of us as they do it. In other words, it's their risk, not ours. Uh, yeah. At present, it's our risk, not theirs. And so uh, Glass Steagall needs to come back. Indeed, and. Um if we were issuing money as credit, we would be taking some of the power away from those investment banks, I would Absolutely. imagine. OK, well, the government's big lie, of course, is there is no money. Money created from nothing. But the British government says we don't have any. And therefore, we've got to sell off um, public infrastructure, uh, which uh, Mike's just covered. And the next big hit, of course, apart from the NHS, uh, is the military. Well, very interesting that uh, front page of the Sunday Times over the weekend was this, revealed the huge gaps in UK's defences. Um, it said that uh, Type 45 destroyers, these, these are advertised by the British government as leading world-beating advanced ships, but apparently they sound like a box of spanners. That's the uh, language used in this article. They are so noisy, they can be detected 100 miles away by submarines. The Type 26 frigates, uh, somebody came up with the idea to get a Chinook on board them, which meant they could uh, um, it, it use them to uh, launch and recover SAS units. Well, that's resulted in a huge cost overrun. So instead of 13 of these ships, they're saying, well, we might order eight. Uh, the Army's Ajax light armoured vehicle, apparently too big to go on the RAF transport aircraft. So they have to sort of dissemble bits of them in order to squeeze them in. Uh, and I was intrigued to see that uh, former Admiral First Sea Lord Sir Mark Stanhope um, said that uh, to design a quiet warship was very expensive. You design noise quietening into warships that are designed to detect and track submarines. We never designed the Type 45 to be a quiet warship. This is, I, w I want to use the B word, Mike, but I'm not allowed to do it on this uh, this program, this is utter, utter rubbish coming out of this man's mouth and being printed by the paper because the noise quietening, well established, it's uh, easy to do most of it, it's cheap. Um, there's no big technology going on here. Um, so what is he talking about? But it's, it's like saying, well, the British is producing a car now, but it's as noisy as if it was a 1973 whatever. Mm. This is complete nonsense. So here's the man, um, and we found a little video clip of him talking about the, um, the last uh, strategic defence review. This is back in 2010, and it's very interesting to see hear what he says. It was a decision made collectively uh, that it would be the tornado that we keep, not the Harrier. That leaves uh, me, us, the defence as a whole, with the challenge of not transferring the capability of carrier strike 
from our current aircraft carriers to our new ones, but there's a gap. We must pull through some expertise to feed the growth path for our new aircraft carriers. So I'm intrigued with this language. We've got this meaningless uh, new speak. Uh, we don't have any operational carriers. We're getting rid of good aircraft. We're not going to be able to keep the expertise. We're going to go groveling to the French to help us train uh, the flight deck crews and, and the expertise. What is this man on? I, I, I don't quite know how to explain this, but you listen to what he says. You watch his mannerisms. Um, what is this man on? There's something wrong with these senior officers. Uh, talking complete nonsense. And of course, what he's agreed to, he didn't resign, he didn't make a big fuss in the press. He simply agreed for there to be this gap, huge gap in U UK carrier operations. And of course, we still don't have the F-35, if at all, if we get it at all after Mr. Trump has trimmed the cost down. Mm. So um, I'll just bring you on to David Ellis of Strategic Defence Initiatives, because in his paper, there's mention to uh, Mark Stanhope uh, because it turned out that he had been um, uh, following the Strategic Defence Review. He'd been meeting with the French to develop joint British-French military doctrine, shared training, equipment and technology and a common supply chain. So this is collaboration that Stanhope was doing with the French when perhaps he should be paying attention to what was going on in the British military. And it's only the UK column that has shown this trail of treason from David Cameron and the Conservative government. Uh, going back to October 2009, the start of these um, uh, dirty closed door discussions with the French, hosted by the charity, the Franco British Council. And these were the backdoor meetings at which it was decided to cut back the size of the British military in order to help ease UK forces into the European Union um, integrated military. And that is continuing at a pace, even though Theresa May says that we're coming out of the EU, utter lies. And uh, finally, we just want to point a finger at uh, the Royal United Services Institute. This claims to be an independent think tank. Uh, here's Dr. Jonathan Isle, who happens to be a Romanian, but he's, he's uh, fully integrated in making decisions on British defence. And this was the team that met behind closed doors. I should say one of the teams that met behind closed doors in order to decide the future of Britain's military. Uh, French military, French politicians. Uh, we had Vice Admiral Paul Lambert there, who was uh, Deputy Chief of Defence Staff. Um, equipment capability. Well, the capability of his equipment seems to be rather suspect, uh, but we've also got Rusi there centre stage. None of these meetings minuted and none of the details made um, available to the British public at the time. So we'll just add this, these two gentlemen in. The first one here, John Louth. Now, he was mentioned in that uh, Times article uh, but we note that he's worked as a senior advisor to the European Defence Agency on the development of pan-European procurement policies and practices. And this is exactly what David Ellis warned about, that the, the um, agenda has always been to destroy Britain's own ability to create what it needs for defence. And this is all to be pushed into a pan-European procurement system backed by a treasury unbelievably dangerous moves and, of course, complete treason by the Tory party. This is another senior gentleman mentioned in the article. Uh, he was a lecturer. He is a lecturer, which I think is a former teacher. I've called him a teacher. But, of course, he's Chatham House and he's also a defence advisor to Westminster. So who are these people, Mike, and where do they get the power to be working behind the scenes? Uh, to change policies which are never discussed or debated with the British public? Well, this is the question. This is the central question of uh, much of our discussion over the last few years on the UK column about the changing nature of governance in this country and the fact that we're 
uh, changing from what was at least purportedly a representative democratic system where uh, MPs represented the views of the people to a participatory democratic system. Um, but of course, part, most people, when they hear the, the term participatory democracy, they think uh, that everybody gets to participate, everybody's voice is heard, everybody yeah. votes on everything. Uh, this is not the style of participatory democracy we're talking about. What we're getting is a, a form of democracy where uh, charities such as Rusi and other vested interests common purpose. Uh, and common purpose participate and the rest of us don't. So the relationship is they participate, push policy into government, and government then represents that policy to us. They sell it to us as if it's something that we want. Yep. Uh, it's not. It's a bunch of vested interests uh, with foundation funding um, pushing forward an agenda which generally is not communicated to the general public. Yeah, by stealth, it, it is treason. Uh, usually the policy comes in by salami slicing a step at a time, or as a very elderly German lady said to us uh, many years ago in Bournemouth, uh, that this was how the Nazi party established um, power in Germany. It wasn't a big rush, she said. It was like the drip, drip, drip of an anaesthetic. And if we look at uh, where the Tory party is moving in Britain today, it's quite clear that what is being installed uh, is effectively a fascist state. Uh, it has some variations. Communitarianism is, uh, is perhaps a useful description. Uh, but the uh, future at the moment, if we allow this to happen, is very serious indeed. That's it for today's news. We'll end on one good bit of uh, one piece of good news, and that is that uh, uh, we had brief communication with the Doherty family over the weekend. Uh, we now know that they are safe and reasonably well, still, of course, immensely stressed as they still have no proper contact with their children stolen by the British state. Uh, but we are pleased to report that they are safe and well and we will give further updates as soon as we're able. Uh, well, actually, we'll have an article up uh, in about an hour's time um, with uh, where we're basically uh, showing the communication from them, so everybody will be able to read that. E excellent. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Um, don't sit there and worry. Do something. Get out, challenge your MP, talk to your local media people, write, email, shout, talk. Uh, because it's exposure that takes the lid off what's happening. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.